Welcome everybody. It's so nice to see lots of people here. Do feel free to turn on your cameras if you want to, but if you're listening while you're cooking or driving or on trains, then obviously we absolutely understand that as well. My name's Libby Thomas. Um, I work on the MSc in Emergency and Resuscitation Medicine at Queen Mary's University. I'm joined here by the very key people on the team, so Prof Tim Harris, um, Ben who's lecturing tonight, and Chris who keeps us all the glue together, um, and Ben who helps organise these wonderful meetings as well. Um, just keep your microphones muted during the talk if you can, that'd be really great, but please do use the, um, the chat function um, or the Q&A function to post questions as we go through the talk and we will try and answer some of those as we go through the talk and we will also then address some of them at the end if we need to too. Um, we're really pleased tonight to be joined by Ben who is an emergency medicine consultant at the Royal London and he is one of the original faculty members on this MSc programme. He is a lecturer at Queen Mary's and he leads the research methods module um, among, among many others and he is uh, one of the experts in research and emergency medicine. Um, he says he can't juggle but he's all right at cooking and, um, and I can attest he's also got very good taste buds because we do enjoy a good meal out every so often to uh, chew the cud and make some plans. I'm going to hand over to you Ben and thank you so much for tonight. Hi, thank you very much, lovely introduction. Uh, give me a moment while I um, share my screen. Um, and just um, say that you can see the see the big blue building, but not the presenter view. Yep, yep great. one big blue building and no presenter view. Great. So uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Libby explained who I am. I'm a consultant or um, in other parts of the world, they call it an attending in emergency medicine at this big blue building, which is the Royal London Hospital in Whitechapel. Um, and I also, as you know, work for the university. I also work a little bit for NHS England. Um, and I'll title this, What You Want May Not Be What You Get, because we're going to do some research themes, uh, some evidence themes, and think about some particular parts. And hopefully this will be kind of applicable um, around the world. Um, this, is, this is a really great map projection, which is one of the only ones that shows all the continental land masses contiguously, as if they're all connected which I think is really great. And it also doesn't emphasize any one country or continent more than any other. It's a, invented by Buckminster Fuller. It's called the Dymaxion map and you can build it. It's really great. First thing I want you guys to think about is if, you're, if you've got a disease that's affecting your patients and um, you think you've got a treatment that can help them, imagine say for instance, it's sepsis um, and there's a treatment that might stop your patient dying. The thing that you're measuring is death. Now, for some patients, regardless of whether they get your treatment or not, they're going to die, unfortunately. And for some patients, regardless of whether you get they get your treatment or not, they're going to live. So for those patients, your treatment has no effect. Some people are always going to die regardless. Some people are always going to live regardless. But those in the middle will hopefully live if they get your treatments and die if they don't. And trying to identify that group of patients, the people who have the disease, who are likely to be affected by the therapy is the key thing when you're designing your trial. So keep thinking about that because that's an important part of design. The first theme we're gonna talk about is heart failure. Uh, and the first paper we're gonna talk about is the Elizabeth trial, which was published a couple of years ago in JAMA. So this is, um, this is a trial of uh, emergency department patients with heart failure, older patients, age 75. Um, and the intervention is uh, an early care bundle, which is um, in accordance with the European Society of Cardiology's treatment for decompensated heart failure. So patients need their pulmonary edema to be treated, their um, coronary stenosis to be treated, their atrial fibrillation to be treated, any super added infection to be treated, the medication to be rationalized, to have CPAP when necessary. So there's a whole bundle of things going on in the intervention and in the control they get usual care, whatever that might be. The outcome that was being measured was number of days alive and out of hospital in within the first 30 days, which is a bit of a weird thing to get your head around. But if you think if the treatment works, the patient will be discharged sooner, which means that they'll be at home alive for more days. So the outcome is a number of days. 
It was a step wedge cluster randomized control trial. That means that the hospitals were the randomization units, not the patient. So each ED kind of flipped to doing the intervention or the control. And they planned when they designed it, they expected that if you got the control, you'd be home for 14 days out of the first 30. And if you got the intervention, then that would improve by 20%. And you'd be home for 17 days. So that's what they were expecting. So they recruited 15 clusters, 503 patients. On average, they were 87 years old, 59% were female. And the event rate in the control group and in the intervention group were identical, 19 days for both. So just remember, they had planned for 14 days without the treatment and 17 days with the treatment. And in fact, they were home for 19 days, regardless of treatment. So what does that mean? Does that mean that their patients were much more well than they had expected? They're spending more time at home and that those that therefore that treatment is never going to make any difference like that. Like I showed you at the beginning, so they were just too well. They were too up at the green end of that blurry spectrum, maybe. And there were some differences. The intervention group got more fruzamide, nitrates, antibiotics, and there were no differences in antiplatelets, antiarrhythmics, and NIV. So there we are. So that's the first heart failure one. The second one is this one the effect of a self care intervention on 90 day outcomes in patients with acute heart failure discharged. And I like this one, it's because it's about trying to support discharge when you've got decompensated heart failure. So it's EDP, ED patients who are discharging. And the intervention is usual care plus a four point tailored discharge plan. Now usual care included rationalization of medication and a one week outpatient appointment. So that's the usual care. And the four point tailored discharge plan is again, a bundle of therapies. So making sure that they are um, working on their eating habits. So that's about sodium intake doing daily weight measurements, um, have, making sure they have a dosset box, as in their, their medications are kind of very organized so they don't miss them, and um, noting down symptoms, which they can then um, contact somebody for help if they get new symptoms. The control was just the usual care, so uh, rationalization of medication on um, uh, a one-week outpatient appointment. And they had a weird, an odd composite outcome. So the thing they measured were cardiovascular death, heart failure events, or a change in this um, Kansas score for cardiomyopathy. So those things lumped together, get you a binary one or one or zero for whether you met the outcome by 90 days. The an RCT time to event Cox proportional hazards and the expected event rate in the control group was thought to be 62%. And they, it wasn't really clear, actually, when you read it, what they expected to happen, how much improvement they expected to happen by the intervention, possibly about 50%. What did they find? So they recruited just under 500 patients, only 7% of the patients that they screened. So, you know, nearly, nearly a 20th of patients um, that they thought might be eligible actually were eligible, which is low. 63 years old on average, 36% female on average, and no difference. No difference in the primary outcome at all. There were no differences in the components either of deaths, visits, readmission, the score, heart failure events, no difference. No difference in um, subgroups of elevated troponin, vulnerable populations, etc. Okay, they, were, they did have low recruitment rates. They had much lower event rates than they thought. Um, and uh, they did do a primary outcome change during the trial. The next one is, I like this one very much because it's looking at, again, trying to get people home from hospital and, and allowing patients to communicate directly into the hospital's electronic patient record using some kind of pinging phone system. So it's kind of like a virtual ward, which I really like the idea of. So again, it's patients discharged from hospital with heart failure. And it's a compound intervention of medication rationalization, uh, making sure that their patients are um, weighing themselves. And they had a financial incentive, um, which was derived by a, a team called the uh, Behavioral Insight Team. And the financial incentive is, is fascinating because it uses some of the theory. I don't know if, you've, if you guys have read Thinking Fast and Slow by David Cameron, but there's a theory in that book which says that humans, we hate the strength of our feeling of losing money 
is greater than the strength of our feeling of gaining the same amount of money. So if you lose a tenner or if you have a tenner stolen, you feel much worse than how good you might feel if somebody were to give you £10. And so the amount of money wasn't much, actually. It was a 18% chance of a $5 payout and a 1% chance of a $50 payout, which works out to about $1.40 a day, which isn't a lot. But it was really kind of motivating because nobody wants to miss out on that cash. And they only got the cash if they um, used the hospital pinging system. Uh, control is usual care. The outcome was time to all cause death by a year. Um, and it was an RCT. They expected 47% to, to have died within a year and in the control and 37% in the intervention. So they saw a 10% drop in outcome rates. Um, they recruited 556 patients. Again, very small proportion of all the patients they screened. Um, 65 years old on average, 48% female. Um, and the event rates and the, uh, in the control and intervention groups were nearly identical, which is making us feel very depressed about heart failure research. Um, but those event rates are much higher, much, much higher than they expected. So conversely to one of the earlier papers I talked about, the mortality is much higher in this group. So in this group, in this study, they may be recruiting much sicker patients than in the uh, previous one. And maybe uh, in that blurry kind of slider I showed you right at the beginning, these are all patients at the red end who were always going to die rather than the other trial who were always going to live. And, and these trials are just not managing to recruit that kind of Goldilocks area of patients in the middle. Um, which brings us to this most recent paper, uh, which was published earlier this year. It's uh, patients with decompensated heart failure who are being admitted with volume overload, so much sicker, not being discharged. Um, the intervention is three days of um, intravenous acetazolamide. Um, the idea being that it potentiates the uh, diuresis in the IV diuretics and prevents sodium reuptake, so you get lower sodium uh, serum levels plasma levels. The control is placebo, and the outcome is a good, uh, interesting outcome. It's successful decongestion. So these people are really fluid overload. They've got pulmonary edema, they've got ascites, they've got peripheral edema, they feel awful, and the outcome is treating that congestion. Um, they expect, and they, and they measured congestion using a scale, and they expected that um, when the control, 15% would be decongested in three days, and uh, with the um, treatment group, 25%. So 10% uh, more would be decongested. And as it happened, the event rate, the decongestion rate was 31%, twice as much as they thought. So just usual care was doing quite well. But with acetazolamide, that leapt up from 31 to 42%. Now you remember that they were expecting 25%, but they actually got 42%. So conversely to the other trials, this is doing really well. It shows finally a treatment that helps in heart failure. Um, so that is that is really great to read. It's a really interesting trial. Um, it shows a, it shows a positive outcome. It's something that we can do to treat our patients. So that's heart failure. Now trauma. So the first trial to talk about in trauma is the proper trial. Now this uh, was published in 2015, so it's not very current, um, and it's a, a randomized controlled trial recruiting severely injured patients who are having a blood transfusion who are in hospital. And their two groups are ratios of transfusion products. So the intervention is one to one to one plasma platelets red cells, and the control is one to one to two plasma platelets red cells. So more blood, um, so more blood proportionally compared to plasma platelets, or if you like, less plasma and platelets proportional to blood. So you might argue that the control group might clot less easily because they haven't got proportionally the same amount of clotting products. And that's the theory. Outcome is nice and easy, mortality at 30 days. It's an RCT. The expected event rate was about 30% mortality in the control group, reduced by 7% to 23% in the treatment group. Okay. And what did they find? They recruited 680 patients, a lot of patients, and they found an event rate in the control group, actually a bit less than 30%, 26%, and a tiny bit less, or pretty bang on, really, for the intervention, 22%. So this is the first trial that we've seen 
where the predictions have actually kind of been pretty close to the actual measured outcome rates. It shows how hard it is that this is the first one we've seen to guess or to predict what, what outcomes are going to happen in a child you recruit to. There was a statistically um, insignificant difference of minus 3.7%, so not statistically significant. Um, and this, this chart here shows you actually that's maybe because it's so very difficult to meet those ratios. So actually the two groups in terms of the blood products they received were pretty similar. The, the main difference was um, there were more platelets given in the one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, but otherwise they were pretty similar. But what was significantly different were the rates of exsanguination and the rates of hemostasis in the intervention one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one group. So it appears that although maybe that one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio may not improve mortality, well, it may, but won't fail to achieve it. Maybe that's a type two error. Um, but may not, it appears to improve rates of bleeding and clotting. Which takes us to the PAMPA trial, which was published in 2018. Uh, these are pre-hospital patients who are severely injured, who are um, randomized to either two units of plasma, so clotting products, or usual care. Again, mortality at 30 days, nice and easy. Cluster randomized trial, predicted uh, mortality rate in the control group, 22%. With a, with a pretty significant reduction in mortality predicted of an absolute rate of 14% and more than 50% relative risk reduction there predicted. So that's, they're really hoping for some pretty spectacular results in this trial. Now, the patients in this trial um, had on average an ISS of 22. If you think about the threshold that kind of is used to define major trauma is 15. So the ISS of 22 means they're quite injured um but the difference was and the difference was um 33 percent so more patients died than they expect in the control group but they did achieve a really significant reduction in mortality of 10 percent absolute reduction um which was statistically significant but you can see those broad confidence intervals which is a reflection of the number of patients they recruited probably it shows that the trial is probably um accurate but really imprecise and if they had recruited managed to recruit more patients then maybe those confidence intervals would be much narrower you can see the kaplan Meyer curve kind of separating nicely there showing that mortality benefit which takes us on to combat so this was also published uh, in 2018 um uh, this is also pre-hospital also plasma um versus saline um, mortality at 28 days, same as 30 days, really. Single centre RCT, so it's a bit smaller. Um, kind of similar event rates predicted, so 25% in the control group dropping as far as 6%, which is a huge reduction. Um, they only recruited 144 patients. Um, far fewer patients died in the um, control group, only 10%. Um, and in the intervention group, 15%. So it kind of went the opposite direction, but it wasn't a statistically significant difference. And um, this is likely because simply too few patients. Also, so too few patients even to kind of be accurate, let alone precise. Um, also, the ISS was a bit higher in this group, so they were more injured. It was 20, more than half of the recruited patients had an ISS of more than 25. So a pretty injured group which takes us on to refill, which you guys may or may not have heard of, which is a UK trial looking at uh, patients who um, were likely bleeding to death, major trauma and hypotensive. The intervention here was packed red cells and lyophilized plasma, so a kind of combination that should cover, if you believe that red cells transfused do carry oxygen, uh, should, car should both enable oxygen carrying capacity and the plasma should enable clotting. So that's the theory. Again, saline. Um, so this started uh, recruiting in 2016, finished recruiting in 2020, and shut a little bit early because of COVID. Um, the outcome was a slightly unusual outcome, where it's a composite. It's not unusual to see composites, but it was a composite of in-hospital mortality. So not 30 days or even 28 days in-hospital mortality, and, and lactate clearance. The lactate clearance is supposed to be a reflection of tissue perfusion. That's the theory in this trial. 
Um, so if you got either of those, you met the uh, you met the outcome. You have to have both. Um, and the 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 method was an RCT. They had expected twenty percent of their patients to die without the treatment, and uh, half that mortality to ten percent with the treatment. That was the hope. That was the prediction. Actually, what happened? They recruited four hundred thirty-two patients. So kind of not the smallest, but not the biggest trial. Um, they recruited a great proportion of the people they screened, which is really good. Young people, mostly men. Um, and they had these huge event rates. So event rates of 65% in the control group and 64% in the, uh, in the treatment group. So, you know, huge proportions of patients are dying in this trial. And so this makes me think that back to that kind of red to green slider, we're recruiting in this trial patients who really were always going to die and and transfusing them is not going to be the thing that's going to save their lives. Um, this and, and clearly there was no statistically significant difference between the two groups and whichever subgroup you look at in all of this in the trial and they looked at many and uh, none of them were um, statistically significant except for the haemoglobin on arrival at hospital I believe. So that's um, that's refill, and that takes us on to trauma trials that are in the offing. So trauma trials which are um, gonna which are gonna happen. So we've got Cryostat two. Um, I realise that I've now been speaking for thirty five minutes. So um, I uh, I'm happy to be dinged out because I've still got sepsis to go. But um, uh, Cryostat is happening. One patient left to recruit. I checked today. That's really exciting. Is cryoprecipitate so fibrinogen versus usual care. So we look forward to the results of that. SWIFT, which is whole blood versus packed well cells in plasma, just started, so quite a way to go there. Looking forward to the results of that. Takes us on to sepsis. So, so you early... can relax, Ben, you can relax. You've only had 20 minutes because we started at seven past for your bit. Oh, I wonder why my thing says 35 minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the uh, intervention, brilliant. So sepsis, I can take my time now. Um, You'll all, have know, you'll all know about this one. This is the Manny Rivers Early Goal Directed Therapy uh, in Sepsis uh, from uh, 2020. Um, and it basically kick-started the idea of goal-directed therapy. So these are sick, septic patients. Uh, there was an expected event rate reduction in this trial of 15%. Um, and actually, uh, that was pretty much bang on. Um, there was an absolute risk reduction of 16% drops, mortality dropped from 47 to 31%, which is a relative reduction of 58%, which is huge. So that's that's great. We all know about that. In this trial, patients on average in the early goal-directed therapy group got five litres plus or minus three litres. And in the control group, they got quite a lot less, three and a half litres uh, plus or minus two and a half litres. So a lot of fluid, but there was a difference. They got the same number of presses, more ionotropes in the early goal directed therapy. So think about that. It takes us on to process. So early goal directed therapy kind of changed the world, I would say. I think it's fair to say. And it and from it grew three big multi-center trials of early goal directed therapy. Process is um, from the States and was published in 2014. Septic shock, three, uh, two interventions and one control. So early goal directed therapy, early goal directed therapy with no inotropes and no central line or usual care. But by this time, early goal directed therapy was so embedded that usual care looked a lot like intervention number two. The outcome was 60 day mortality and the method was a multi-center RCT. And they expected the event rate to be, well, they gave a range interestingly, from 30 to 46 percent, and they expected a reduction of about seven percent if they got the intervention. So they're being modest now with the expectations, which is kind of nice to see conservative thinking, I think, although I get why people kind of predict these great big um, reductions. But what they found was no difference at all. They recruited 1300 patients and the rates were statistically not different at all. Um, the amount of fluid was even pretty similar, and that's pretty important. So uh, the, between group one and group two, the fluid was the same, actually. And in, uh, uh, sorry, group one and, and sorry, fluid EGTD group two should say control, this second one here, this third, this third bullet point. So they're the same. 
and then a little bit more in the in the second treatment group. Pressors were higher, as you'd expect. Iron traits were higher, as you'd expect in the EGTT group. That takes us on to the UK one, which is called um, Promise. So Promise, septic shock, early goals direct therapy, 90-day mortality, multi-center RCT, expected 40% mortality with a reduction to 32%, so an 8% reduction. Uh, about the same number of patients, no difference. So everybody, so pretty much their predicted mortality rate for the intervention is what happened to everybody. Everybody, both groups had about 30% mortality reduction. Um, and in this, the fluids were basically the same again. More pressors in the early gold directed therapy group again. So very similar results. And then in a rise, which is the uh, Australian New Zealand one, again, really similar 90 day mortality, uh, similar predictions. So dropping from 38 to 30%, their outcomes 19%. So their patients actually maybe were a bit more well or maybe had better genes or who knows, but those patients had low, that, that, that trial had lower mortality rate than the other two trials. Again, the fluid amount was very similar. And then there was a, a meta-analysis of those three trials, which showed um, no difference as well. So or overall, across all those three trials, there was a 25% mortality rate, regardless of group. So what does that tell us? The change from the loads of fluid versus not as much fluid in early goal-directed therapy meant that everybody was doing early goal-directed therapy, which meant when you test it against usual care, usual care is early goal-directed therapy, which makes it um, hard to know if, um, if it as an individual thing works. Which takes us on to this fascinating trial from Zambia, um, where 90% of the patients in this trial had, um, had HIV. So probably a very different physiological, immunological group to the uh, promise process arise groups. Um, it's early resuscitation protocol. Uh, is in hospital mortality is the outcome. So single center RCT, and they expected a much higher mortality rate than those previous trials. So uh, clearly uh, in, in this trial, they were really expecting something a lot different to what has already been published. The 65% with a reduction to 45%, so a big reduction. They got 212 patients actually in the control group, 33% died, but in the intervention group, 48% died. And that was a statistically significant difference. So the early treatment in this group was actively harmful. Um, and in the uh, early group, they got more fluid compared to the control group. So actually, maybe here we're seeing that more fluid might be harmful, particularly in this group of patients, which is the first time that we're kind of beginning to imagine that maybe fluid is harmful, which takes us to this observational cohort study, a propensity score based analysis. That's kind of like doing an RCT using observational data, kind of. It's a way to think about it anyway. So these are they're taking a whole bunch of people with septic shock and chunking them up into patients who got an early or delayed vasopressors. It's only 186 patients, quite small for an observational cohort study. Um, the early presser group only got 900 mils, whereas the delayed presser group got two, two litres. So it kind of more than doubled. So, if you, so that gives us the impression that maybe if you give people noradrenaline early, then maybe they get less fluid. And if you think that the Zambia study is uh, might influence your thinking, then you might want to give less fluid. So that's really interesting. Uh, and that takes us on to this, which is another observational cohort study looking at um, adrenaline in patients with septic shock. Again, it's early versus delayed. Similar numbers, just over 200. Um, the mortality associated with early noradrenaline therapy was 29% versus late noradrenaline um, was 43%. And they did do their very best to, to adjust for confounders, of course, because it's an observational study. Um, but there is a problem with adjusting for confounders, which is it's thought that known confounders probably only account for about 30% of confounders. And there's still 70% of confounders, which you just can't measure if you're doing an observational study, which is why randomization is just the gold standard. They found that every one hour delay in noradrenaline led to a 5% increase in mortality as well. 
Um, and this takes us to this randomized control trial, um, which is really just a pilot, so quite small numbers. Um, septic shock patients in the ED, restricted fluid with peripheral noradrenaline to maintain me mean arterial pressure. That was the um, intervention, so peripheral norad, um, and control is 30 mils per kilogram of fluid. The outcome is the total amount of fluid given, not mortality, uh, single centre, and they recruited just under 100 patients, uh, and there's a big difference. Um, so only half a litre if patients get NORAD peripherally versus one and a half litre, one and a half litres, and longer amount of time on presses, interestingly, um, if they um, have usual care. So that's really interesting because it's making us think, right, okay, so first of all, peripheral noradrenaline, if you're not used to using it and you're worried about it, well, this showed that it was safe and you can do it. And secondly, that giving uh, vasopressors early um, might be um, a really good thing to do. And this takes us on to this Thai study um, called Sensor. This is an RCT as well. Patients with septic shock, the intervention was early noradrenaline, the control was usual care, the outcome is a shock control rate. So not a patient-centered outcome, more a measured kind of physiological outcome. Single center RCT, 300 patients, 76% had the uh, had the shock control rate in the intervention group and um, only 48% in the control group. So it looks like the early noradrenaline is really helping shock as well. So more evidence that early noradrenaline might be valuable. And that takes us on to this very recently published study in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is um, the CLOVERS trial, patients with septic shock, and it's restricted fluid versus usual case. The idea is that we've learned, we've had all this evidence that maybe um, running people dry might have a mortality benefit. Let's do a big trial and see. So the multi-center RCT, 1,500 patients and no difference, no difference in, in outcomes, 14% versus 14.9%. Uh, you, may, you may say that the confidence intervals are broad and a, and a reduction in mortality of up to 4.4% or an increase in mortality of up to 2.6% is important, but it uh, failed to show a difference. And why is this? I think maybe we can come to talking about why is this, but some ideas are that maybe sepsis is actually a very heterogeneous disease. And if we're just chucking everybody with sepsis into one big trial, we're failing to identify the kind of interesting heterogeneity where there are different therapeutic strategies that might be of value like patients with cardiac dysfunction versus patients that are hypovolemic versus patients that have leaky capillaries versus patients that are refractory to vasopressors. Um, all, sorts of, all sorts of questions, which unfortunately this trial couldn't answer. Um, the only other thing to say here is that there was a big difference in the amount of fluid given. So both groups got about two liters before randomization, but the intervention group only got 1300 mils and the control group got uh, kind of more than three liters. Which takes us on to trials that are, that are recruiting at the moment for sepsis that are gonna be really interesting. So EVIS is early vasopressors presses in sepsis, um, and uh, we're recruiting at the Royal London to this, it's from Glasgow, more than 3000 patients, um, and it simply, uh, it simply, starting noradrenaline early through a peripheral line. Um, and the idea being that you use less fluids and there might be a mortality benefit. Um, Pronto is a really interesting trial. It needs a lot of patients. More than 7,000 patients are required for this trial. Um, but essentially patients are randomized to, um, to kind of three, th three risk levels for which there are kind of actions associated. And the risk level is based either on simply the National Early Warning Score 2 or the National Early Warning Score 2 with a procalcitonin, um, uh, point of care procalcitonin measurement, which is um, a kind of biomarker that can differentiate um, bacterial and non-bacterial in inflammation, unlike, for instance, CRP, right? Um, and so, you know, the high risk gets gets a lot of attention, the medium risk gets less attention, and the low risk gets even less attention. 
Um, and the outcomes are really interesting as well because uh, they've got two outcomes actually. They've got mortality and they've got antibiotic therapy. And the amount of antibiotics given, so it's an antibiotic vigilance study, and the amount of antibiotics given, they think will reduce using procalcitonin, they hope from 90 to 80%, and that's a superiority um, kind of calculation. And mortality is just a non-inferiority cal calculation. So what they're trying to do there is show that if you use cal procalcitonin, then you will use less antibiotics with no increase in mortality. So it's kind of, I think it's a pretty cool, clever way to do it. And that takes us to the end of sepsis. Just a couple of papers about, you know, actually we talked about thousands and thousands of patients, but when it's, you know, my mum in hospital, then I want people to treat her with respect and, uh, and as a human, you know. So I just wanted us to kind of end this thinking about the actual patient it is the center of everything we talk about. And the interaction with the patient and the doctor or the, or the paramedic or the nurse or the physician's associate or any, any other of the um, amazing types of practitioner we have in our exotic ecosystem now, um, that interaction is where the magic happens. So the first one is this interesting um, uh, perspective published by Katrina Cox and Zoe Fritz, who are acute physicians in England. And they say that the language that we use to describe patients is uh, belittling, uh, emphasizes passivity. It could be a language of blame. So for instance, we say, what's their presenting complaint? As if they're complaining, where we could be thinking, well, what's the symptom that they've attended with? Um, we use words like deny. So she denies having a fever as if you've accused her of having a fever and she denies it as if you're a judge, you know, or, um, or, or the passivity part of, patient, of, of the interaction or the infantilization where the clinicians have all the agency. So we take a history, we sent the patient home, patients are either compliant or non-compliant, um, and we could use words like concordant or adherent. And then finally, they, they say that there's a language of blame the way we use Kind of moralistic language like this she has poorly controlled diabetes even if that person is doing everything according to the book and the diabetes is um and the sugars are, are not controlled well it implies uh, a kind of a degree of um patient responsibility even though they're doing everything they should so i think it's interesting just to think about that i don't think i agree with every single part of it but i think it's certainly uh, really interesting. And then the final one I wanted to mention in, in this kind of vein is uh, words matter. What do patients find judgmental or offensive in outpatient notes? So think about the notes that you write when you see a patient, when you listen to this. So this um, was a survey to patients in the States and they were asked to respond to two dichotomous questions. One, the first one was, have you ever felt offended by something you read in a visit note or something you read read in a visit note and have you ever felt judged by something you read in a note um, and they were given access to the electronic health record and if they said yes to either of those then they said please explain what offended you and please explain what made you feel judged so this was qualitative research as well um, and what was found uh, well they, they asked 30,000 patients which are a lot right and 20,000 responded which is also a lot, that's what, 6,000 patients. So this is the biggest one in, in everything that I've talked about so far, which is pretty cool, I think. Um, and of those patients that responded, 11% uh, did feel judged or offended. Um, they felt disrespected in general. They felt condescended against. They felt not heard or misquoted. They felt that there was language that was used, which was jargony, you know, they couldn't understand. They thought that in the notes there were errors. Um, so thing, inaccuracies, mistakes, unintentional lies even, things that they don't remember having happened at the time. They thought that there were confidentiality concerns and the diagnosis that was in the notes wasn't always discussed with them. And then there was labeling in, in ways that they did not identify. So uh, including obesity, gender, sexuality, and all sorts of other stigmatic terminology. 
Um, and I think if you've ever been the advocate, as I have, for a family member or a friend who's a patient, and you kind of watch from the outside the interaction between the patient and the clinician, it's, I think it's, it's really eye-opening. There are some people who use nothing but jargon, how you stand, how you look, where you look, what you hold, what you do. It's all, it all actually contributes to how that patient feels. And if the patient leaves feeling like you've got them, like that you, the clinician, understand them and you've got a plan, even if you can't cure them, which for most patients in ED you can't, then I think that's the job done well. So this, I thought, was a really kind of thought-provoking paper to read. And uh, that's the end of my talk. So thank you very much. I can um, take any questions you like. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you so much, Ben. And I really like that bit at the end as well. There's a couple of nice comments coming through from Emma and from Aris. But I think it's actually, if we're going to be conducting research and thinking about how we interact with patients and include people in, language is so, so important. So thank you for that. Um, not many questions as we go along through, which was fine. Everybody was stunned into silence, but would anybody like to put their hands up and ask any questions to Ben? Ben, can I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. So you, you made some really good points there and you made it beautifully with the fluids that we often see small trials usually run by enthusiasts, in this case, early norepinephrine. Uh, noradrenaline or norepinephrine that lead to a positive outcome and then we do a more neutral trial where we try and show that that intervention in this case early peripheral norad can be generally applied uh, and that trial is often negative and I've seen this play out so many times over the years in medicine and I'm just interested for your take you made a comment you know I, I think I know where that is in your comment so when I look at this is it because enthusiasts are biased um, in other words, there's something about the recruitment. Is it because they have skills that are not generalizable? So the ability, the subtle abilities that we can't usually allow for in trials simply aren't there. Um, or is it bias in recruitment or is it intrinsic bias of the study? I can think of so many reasons to explain why a little trial may be positive and, and a big one negative. And I'm completely guilty of this myself. You know, I, I, over the years, I've watched this behavior in myself where I want a trial to be, which I believe in something. What's your take? I think, I think that there's a practicality in, in designing and delivering a trial, um, which is funding. Um, and so if you um, say to a funder, look, we want to we want to recruit these people. This disease is really important. And they say, fine, we believe you that the disease is really important, but how effective is the treatment really going to be? And, and if, you, if you think, well, actually, take tranexamic acid, it's effective, but you need to have a lot of people for it to be effective. You need to treat a lot of people for it to be effective. That's why those trials recruited 20,000 people. But that's expensive. Tranexamic acid was quite cheap, is a, is a cheap drug, but you know, it, um, critical care therapies are, are not, um, and uh, the disease is less common. So you, I think, therefore, there is a um, a desire to represent the potential treatment effect before the trial is done more positively than necessarily it turns out to be. Um, and I think as you say, you, you can recruit much more, you can recruit in a small center, much more specific population groups, which is just much harder to recruit um, in multi-center kind of rolled out trials delivered by kind of more generic researchers. So for instance, in the, in the, in the, in the sepsis work, you know, we might want to recruit patients who only have cardiac dysfunction. Mm. How are we going to identify those using um, generic research nurses? Train them all up to do an echo, get everybody to have a troponin. You know, it's very difficult um, and possibly prohibitively difficult. I think this is a, a problem that can go both ways, because if you believe just the large trial, we're saying on average it doesn't work in a general population, but it may be actually in an expert's hands that intervention could work well. And that, um, you know, 
I was, was uh, listening to a wonderful talk on the tyranny of trials, which basically suggested we all do what the big trials say. And it, it was a very reasonable principle. Mm. But I do believe there is diversity in patients and also diversity in medical practitioners. Yeah. Do you think it's a fair point? Oh, I think, of course it is. I mean, um, there is a difference between what you choose to do as a physician with a patient in front of you with access to uh, objective information that was com that was just not measured in all these trials um, and whatever the trial results are or guidelines. I mean, the, the trials then um, inform guidelines, which are guidelines, which means you can you can you can step off them if you have got uh, a justified reason for doing so. Ben, thank you. Um, we're not having any more um, questions for the moment. I wondered if I could just invite Libby to say a little bit about the master's programme and invite any of you in the audience, if you wanted to, to uh, ask us questions about the master's programme with Libby, Ben, myself, Chris and David all work for this programme. And of course, many in the room are part of it. And perhaps David could uh, put up a slide that will allow you to um, follow a QR code if you're interested in coming to study with us. Thanks, Tim. So just to let everybody know, if you're interested in um, working and learning from Ben and Tim more and exploring sort of emergency and resuscitation medicine to a greater level, then we do run our three year part time master's program. So you can take it as a PG Cert after one year or PG Dip after two years or do the full three years. Um, and it's based out of Queen Mary's University in East London, but it's a distance learning master's. So it's all done online with online face to sort of online face to face tutorials every Thursday throughout the, uh, the four eight week blocks. Um, but otherwise, the lectures you watch in your own time. Um, and we also it is open to doctors, nurses and paramedics. So it's great. It's interprofessional. You're learning from people working pre hospitally and in hospital and from colleagues all around the world. So we've got some of our students on the call today who join us from the um, African subcontinent, Indian subcontinent across Europe. Um, Tim has managed to pull together faculty from across the world who are leaders in emergency medicine in their field who've um, written some of the lectures and delivered those. In addition to the emergency and resuscitation medicine MSc, we also have a one that's in tactical military or steer and operational medicine. So we look at the um, some more specifics around those people who work in this area. So it's combined with the uh, emergency and resuscitation one, but with a couple of specific modules. And we have quite a lot of um, faculty who come from the armed forces and share their expertise of working in special operations, disaster response and other areas. So it's really great to put on them. And then finally, we do have the paediatric emergency medicine, which is run in conjunction with Don't Forget the Bubbles and is led by Tessa Davis, um, who is absolutely amazing educator. And likewise, this is a three year MSc with the opportunity to do one, two or three years. Um, though we do encourage you all to do the three years and sort of build up to it. Um, but you can make your choice on that. Um, but again, it's all online and it's the distance learning. It's trying to draw people from the world around the world. But the PEM one is also um, it's run through a different. It's done sort of more conversationally. So it's done through a platform called Circle where there's questions posed every four weeks and the students engage in the answers of that, um, trying to pull on the literature um, and evidence and engaging in debate with the lecturers who again are experts from around the world. So I was facilitating a tutorial last week and somebody was joining from East Coast America, people are joining from Australia um, and from all over. So it's really great. Um, I can see Solomon said there's also a summer school. Absolutely. So there's a summer school that's run for year one and or year two, depending on spaces. Um, and last year we had 27 students, um, including Solomon and colleagues who came from Nigeria and from Cameroon. Um, and it was fantastic to pull everybody together and do some face to face. That's not compulsory, but that's part of the uh, building the community of practice and learning that we try to create. Um, so that's really great there. Um, and um, is it some nice comments there um, from people about the program? And if you've got any questions, then please do ask. We do have one question. Um, well, 
Carlos made a really interesting comment. I was inviting him through, but he doesn't have a microphone, but he, he made the, a really good point about patient populations. Um, Salman has asked if you can ask about a PhD. So Salman, um, we are not a PhD school, but of course you can ask. Uh, do you have a microphone? So, Salman, please uh, switch on your mic and uh, ask us your, your question. Well, hi, Tim uh, and Ben and Libby. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I've been recently interested in, in, in basically cardiac tamponade and traumatic cardiac tamponade. And I've been talking to some people at LA uh, about doing a PhD in that topic. And I was asked to... Uh, ask both of you whether I can uh, how to go about this doing the, the QMPL. So you you wanted to join and come and do a PhD, and you've been discussing this with uh, the London Air Ambulance team. Did I hear you correctly? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I, I mean the, the by far the biggest area of research in our institute, our institute's called the Blizzard, that that involves trauma is is through the um, trauma sciences program which we're very much linked to and run by Kareem Brohi. Um, Kareem's major focus is blood and coagulopathy but he has uh, taken on a number of other students. Uh, do you have a grant in place or are you looking to come here and find a grant and pick up the PhD? I haven't yet done anything about it just think part about the topic. Uh, yeah I don't have a grant in place and I was looking through the and IHR grants, it doesn't seem like any one of them fits that particular topic. What I'm going to do is put my email address in and I'm going to invite comments from Libby and Ben because they've actually got proper PhDs and they're real doctors. I'm a pretend one. Um, you're very welcome to just email me and we can pick up and talk over WhatsApp. What country are you based in? Uh, I'm in UK. You're in the UK. Okay, yeah. yeah. Salmon, I, 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 Salmon is one of our um, ex RLH North East London EM trainees. Ah, Ben, he's thank a, you. He's, he, he, you love him. You love him. He's a whiz with a with an ultrasound. <laughs> um, I apologise for not recognising. Salmon, why don't you um, get email Tim and I, um, Tim and me? I mean, um, uh, kind of outside of this group, and we'll see if we can meet up and work out um, a plan for you. Perfect, thank you. Any other questions about uh, the masters? Chris is here, who's the guru of all things uh, technical um, and administrative. Um, otherwise, it is three minutes to seven. And we're having time. I was I think just joining the chat, Libby. There are, there's some lovely comments, and it's interesting to see how much people are responding to language. I mean, presenting complaint, one of our colleagues has put up, and that's lovely because patients come, uh, complaint really is a terrible word. <laughs> it's, it's almost like you're judging them for walking in your hospital door. And uh, words matter so much because they, they actually say, that they're, the words we use are the things that represent us, not just to our colleagues, but our patients. And uh, that was a very inspiring talk, Ben. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. So Absolutely. No, thank you very much, Ben. We really appreciate your time this evening. And it's really great. It's really good to sort of think about actually what's being achieved in these trials that we're actually looking critically at them over the time. Um, and I think language, again, is just so important as well and something we really need to be mindful of. So um, thank you all for joining us on this um, sunny Thursday. For those of you in the UK, enjoy the coronation. For those of you in the, not in the UK, enjoy being able to watch other things on the TV this weekend because we won't be able to. It'll be taking over everything. And um, keep an eye on our Twitter account. We do post our different um, webinars as they come through on that. And we've got a couple more lined up coming into the summer. So our Twitter account is at Resus Masters. Um, and you can follow us on there. And thank you very much. Libby, thank you for comparing and uh, running this all. Uh, Libby has run a series of webinars. There will be other webinars, so we'll see you in a month or thereabouts. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.